You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 74. What causes implant failures? It's that dreaded conversation that we really don't want to have with a patient when we have to walk into a room and tell them that their implant is failing. Listen, it's not the 90s anymore. What really is causing our implants to fail? Was Carl Misch right about biomechanics? John and I reveal some interesting things about what we know about implant failure. And stay tuned, at the end of this conversation, we reveal how to manage prosthetically your implant cases from an occlusion standpoint, how to set them up for the best and most predictable outcome. There's this and so much more this week on The Dental Guys. This episode of The Dental Guys is brought to you by the Dental Crafters Network, your implant restorative connection. From surgical planning to patient-specific guides, quality implants, and final restorations, the Dental Crafters Network provides one relationship with infinite possibilities. Call 1-800-472-8302 today. That's 1-800-472-8302. And by Restorative Driven Implants. Understand, place, restore, and implement dental implant treatment from John and Wes, the dental guys. Go to restorativedrivenimplants.com right now to sign up for the next series of courses and take your implant education to the next level. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm John, The Dental Guy. And I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And man, you know, we're going to do something a little different today. Uh, we're going to do the product of the week first. It's never before been done on the show that the product of the I mean, week is the first. Let's get it out of the way right away because it means so much to right. us. Because it's a good one. <laughs> it is it's a, a good, good one. one. But, but we first, in order to make the product of the week make sense, I want to just... I want Wes to tell us a story. Wes, tell us a story. It's story time on the dental guys. It's story time. <laughs> Just sit back, relax, pop open a beverage, and listen yeah, to us. Yeah, where Wes's are you at story. right now? Are you still mowing grass? Because we are. <laughs> that's what, are that's still, what I'd be doing. Are you still listening to the dental guys mowing grass? Because I'm telling you right now, it's it's raining like crazy here, and it never quits growing. Oh man, it never <laughs> it seems stops. Like I'm mowing never more than stops. once a week. It's unreal. That's wrong. Well, let me tell you a little story here. So, <clears throat> you know. I, I love dental implant surgery, and especially um, you guys, if, you, if you're not following us on Facebook, we are doing a lot more live streaming. And the other day, I got in the car and I said, hey, it's an awesome time when you can get up in the morning and you know you're headed over to your specialist uh, to, to do some full arch dental implant therapy. In fact, this was a massive case. Full Arch Friday, uh, full if Ar you will. Full Arch Friday, if you will. Um, That's how I, we roll. I love Full Arch Fridays. Um, Me too. Thank God it's Full Arch Friday um, right. a lot lately, and uh, there'll be more to come on that. But, um, hey, catch out the live streams. You know, Just make sure you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, um, and make sure you send us some feedback on that kind of stuff because it really helps us. We're going to keep doing some of those things. Um, but yep. I was heading over to my specialist for Full Arch Friday, and we um, had a special case planned, um, full upper, full lower, a uh, couple of zygomatic implants. I always get the hard Ooh. stuff, John. I mean, nice. like you do too. Yeah, and you asked for it. You we asked, asked for it. it. We asked. Yeah. We asked for we these like, cases. We complain, but we asked for it. I mean, who? Uh, it's crazy. It's fun. It's fun. It is a lot of fun. There's so a you're throwing lot. in some titanium. Well, your surgeon's throwing in some titanium. Surgeon's throwing in some titanium. I'm sitting there holding his hand and uh, guiding it. And uh, <laughs> holding his hand. Yeah. <laughs> he needs a lot of help. Yep. And uh, doing some bunny <laughs> yeah, right. reduction while he's out of the room. <laughs> so... Anyway, cleaning up messes in the other rooms and uh, just... Uh, but anyway, we were picking up the upper prosthetic and, man, eight, seven implants picked up in one full arch hybrid. Man, that's a great, that's a great Ooh, that's thing, a man. Feeling. You know, my it's assistant a good feeling and I when they all pull and all the cylinders come all out. All the cylinders like, yes. drop into that prosthetic and then all you have to do <clears throat> at this point is just, hey, when you're taking, unscrewing each one of those cylinders after you've looted them to the prosthetic in the mouth. 
okay, you're counting the screws. Now, some of the screws will actually, when you're backing them out, will actually hang up inside the cylinders, and that's okay, just as long as you don't, like, knock one down the patient's throat. And so... Um, yeah, just, it's a bad day. And, and we're always counting. So you're always counting in surgery. It comes to from my surgical experience at the hospital. You're counting galls. You're counting two by twos. You're counting screws in full arch Friday cases. And so the little prosthetic nat screws that come out of the transmucosal abutments, they're pretty small. So and they do friction fit to the yeah. hex. So that's kind of nice. So yeah. Um, yeah. we pull out it, we count, count, count our screws. And then my sir, while I'm in the, um, lab doing some finishing work on the prosthetic, my surgeon's going to the lower arch and starting to do some extractions down there. So I picked up my upper, he's working on the lower. I walked back in the room and he was like, Hey, we saw a yellow prosthetic screw in the vestibule. Did you all count the screws? Oh, and I was like, I looked at Megan. I was like, we counted screws, and oh. and he said, you know, we tried to get it and it just disappeared, and we oh, think it went man. up into the suction. We think. Okay. So okay. you don't, but you don't, but he doesn't really know. He doesn't really know. Now we're talking about a very tiny prosthetic screw. Oh yeah, those things now, are tiny, tiny. If the patient, um. <clears throat> ingested it and it went into the stomach no problems right it's not okay a big deal. but if the patient aspirates mm. Mm. the screw mm -hmm. that means and they're sedated so they have no clue <clears throat> right so and it's so small it's, it's easy so to small, aspirate you can't you can't see this stuff yep if the patient aspirates the screw you you have to get a chest X-ray because that has to be removed. Now you don't. So know. wait 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 wait. So what? you. <laughs> so when did this decision gets made? Like at that point. Okay, so like, the we got to know. No, so the decision happens right then and there because the patients they're sedated, they're breathing, their their sats are good. So what we're doing is we're saying, okay, we have to have a chest X-ray now. Okay, yep. so that means after the surgery. Within the next several days, the patient will go to the hospital. Yes, we read, wrote a script for a chest X-ray, and okay. guess who pays for that chest X-ray? Not the patient. No, not the patient. Myself and the oral surgeon, we pay for. Oh, and yeah. In this case, my oral surgeon would never have me pay for it he was like dude i got this you know no worries you know right it's in his office right. he's gonna take care so of it. they call the hospital say hey you know she's gonna be coming over in a few days get that x-ray just to make sure that it's not down the not down in the lungs because if it's down in the lungs or in the bronchioles you got to go right. after it now, that would be bad it, yeah. because that's even more expensive but let's just say that the average chest x-ray you know runs between three and five hundred dollars if you were to pay out of pocket for that and and obviously they're paying out of pocket Right, yep. but you have yep. to do it. You yeah, have it's a to. must. You can't. If, you can't if say not. we'll wait on that. So, yeah. so one saying on the end of this podcast, like the guys that are mowing right now and the gals that are, you know, you know, doing whatever they're doing. <laughs> maybe they're mowing too. I don't know. Dental exactly. Gals. There could be mowing there could too. Be mowing weed too. eating, doing everything. But who who knows what you guys are doing right now? But I know what you're saying. You're saying where's the throat pack? And I'm yep. saying the same thing. Where yeah, in the so world? Here's, it, and you know? here is where, you know, the, the good assistants at oral surgery office, they keep trying yeah, oh, they to were, get us to put... Listen, it can happen. They're doing everything they can to get us to put the throat pack in. It's not their fault. No. They realize it's important. But whose problem is it? It's the doctors. We're the ones that are like, get that out of there. Now, why? Because you know how frustrating it is. I mean, the classic scenario, you're in there, you're trying to get the screws out of the most distal cylinders so that you can pull and the thing out. And what does that 4x4 do? It wraps up around your wrench. Yeah, it gets all that. up in your business, man. And you're just trying to get the screw out, but the stupid 4x4 is all wrapped around, and you can't get your fingers around it. You can't get back to it. It's going everywhere. Now the patient's kind of like choking a little bit, so now you got to get out of it. So why did we start with the story? Well, let me tell you right because now. The 
Yeah, this is the, the inter- product. The product of the week. Product of the week now is is interesting, but it could because it, it, it just didn't come in time enough for this story because <laughs> yeah, because you needed it at the surgeon's like, office, but you have it at been your on my life. Where has this been all my life? If yeah, you're doing so, a significant amount of implant surgery, John, tell them a little bit about what yeah. what we got. So uh, so now I'll just we'll just I mean we we evaluate products from time to time. You know we get a chance to evaluate products. And, you know, sometimes we get sent some stuff and we're like, yeah, this is not going to work, you know? <laughs> so we got sent a product that I'd never seen anything like before by Zerk. It's called Airway Armor, mm. okay? So what this is, and I want you to, you know, just get on the get on the website. You know, we'll, we'll throw a couple pictures up. Yeah, on if you're CD, on YouTube, yeah, the, you can just YouTube. see it there. And it's in the link in the description yeah. below. Yeah, it's just go to Airway, Airway Armor, go to Zerk's website, uh, zerk.com. And uh, so you can see what I'm talking about. But what you can kind of, if you can kind of visualize, if you can't get off the mower right now, you know, imagine <laughs> kind of a, uh, you know, imagine imagine a, a, you know, a plastic, like it almost looks kind of like a, a perforated impression tray, but it's it's rubber, uh, flexible, uh, and, and it basically is just like a curtain. You know, we talk about like a pharyngeal curtain being the real word name for right. a throat pack. And it really looks like a little curtain. It looks almost like, it's kind of like the idea if you could take the flap off of Mr. Thirsty, okay, yep. the Zerk product, or like ISO, ISOVAC, that kind of thing. So if you could take the flap off of Mr. Thirsty, if you're familiar with that product, and you could punch a bunch of little holes in it, mm-hmm. and you could make it extend behind, you know, the the uh, uh, like the hamular notch areas right. on the upper, okay, and it would kind of nest up in the vestibule, and it would nest up in the palate, and it would sit down over the tongue, and it's perforated so that you can still breathe, but... Then you can ligate it with floss to where you know it's not going anywhere. And it is like the perfect throat pack because it is just big enough that the patient can breathe through it. So if you have a non-sedated patient, they're not right. going to feel like they're getting choked. Hey, but if you've is, ever used any type of you know uh, isolation system like Zerk's Mr. Thirsty or um, Isolite, listen, this yeah. product is easier for the patient to put in. Much easier. Much easier. Because it's not bulky at all right. compared to a throat pack. I mean, if you have a non-sedated patient, uh, man, a throat pack's really bad because sometimes they feel like they're they're choking. Right. You can throw this thing back there in the back and it you doesn't can get in your way. You know, I mean, doesn't I, get yeah, yeah. It doesn't get caught up in your wrench. Right. And and it's just small enough that stuff's not going to go through these little perforated holes. Um <clears throat> and so I, I I would say when I use this the first time I was like, well, this thing kind of looks a little like flimsy. I was a little worried about it, but you know, that's the that's actually the beauty of it is it's not this big bulky thing. It's not rigid. It's comfortable for the patient even when they're not sedated. So I've been using it for every implant surgery that I do now. Um, or when I have like a, a full arch case, we're doing like a try-in, yeah. you know, and you're or you're doing like a one the one screw test and you're doing the most if you're doing a lot screw of screw tests you know little tiny pieces and parts yeah I mean, verification jigs maybe like whatever, a number right? two number 15 crown that doesn't have a lot of retention on number 15 yeah you know if you're using right. you know a seric or a milling machine in your office and you're doing these procedures and your tiny assistants in there and they're doing a lot of that work hey look john a chest x-ray costs between three right. and five hundred dollars and who's paying for that right Okay. You right. Are. So airway armor. The one thing I thought about it first, and I would just say it. I mean, I thought I was like, it's a little expensive. I thought the same thing. You're talking. It's about two, three bucks a use, uh, depending on on which size you get. But if you think about it here, you don't need to use this on every patient. Right. You need to use this on the patients that you are worried about them aspirating something. You're worried about dropping something. You know, especially I think implant procedures or or, or small parts and pieces. Worth checking out. I mean, when I compare this to a four x four, I mean, I know four x four is cheaper, but dude, there's no, there's no comparison. Well, Zerk reached so, out. Zerk reached out to us because they heard about my stories. Yeah, <laughs> I got more stories. You know, my stories. <laughs> and John, they're, yeah, they're the offering our listeners a, a little little intro offer, a little intro. Yes. Well, I don't even know how many times you can use the code, but like John, give him the code. Yeah, so they offered us uh, a code to give, which is DG five off. So that's that's the letters DG, the number five. We'll put it in the link in the O-F-F. description below. Yeah, DG five you know? off for five dollars off of an Airway Armor trial kit because you know they heard that we were using it, we liked it, 
we've, we told them this is a great product, told them how we're using it. And they said, Hey, well, if people want to check this out, this is one way they can do it. I'd highly recommend you check it out. Uh, especially if you're doing any of the things we mentioned. So hey. hopefully next time Wes will have an airway armor <laughs> at the surgeon's office. I think I will. And that will save everybody time. a little stress and save everybody. It's nothing worse than patient waking up and you say, Oh, speak, you know, it's no big deal, <laughs> but you may have a screw in your lung. <laughs> But it's fine, you know, and you're like, okay, how do I say this one? So now this is going to segue perfectly into the show today because it is, really, it is, it is, it is. And I want to tell you why, because the show is all about dental implants Mm. and it's all about what causes problems. You know, Wes is talking about a story where he had a different kind of implant problem, but what are the implant problems we talk about the most when we go to lectures is failure. Everybody's worried about failure. Everybody's talking about it all the time. What causes failure? What makes things work? How can I have more success? And what keeps a lot of of people from from, uh, placing implants, especially, Mm. is that they're concerned about failure. But, you know, historically, failure has been very hard to pin down as to what's caused it. Although, if you ask somebody, they'll almost always give you a reason very dogmatically Mm. where they think things why they think implants fail. I want you to ask yourself right now, if you're listening to this, before we say anything else, why do implants fail? Why do I believe that implants fail? Well, let's say, what is the success rate of a dental implant? Let's just say it's 97%, okay? Yeah, let's say it's 97. And so what are the 3% failures caused by who? and, and, And then I want you to ask yourself this too. Who told you that? Where'd you learn that? Did you learn that from a book? Did you learn that from an instructor? Did you learn that from a lecturer? Wes, let's go back to what we thought we know we knew, and let's let's talk about what has maybe been the most prevalent idea of why implants fail, going back to probably the '90s, especially yeah. uh, when implants started to hit their stride, at least in the United States. Tell let's let's talk about what was the reason why most people talked about implant failure. Well, probably one of the most read. Um, implant textbooks and authors when it comes to surgical uh, procedures regarding or kind of like maybe the Bible of dental implant um, understanding in the modern era or what began the modern era of dental implant therapy in the 90s and early 2000s, Carl Misch wrote Contemporary Implant Dentistry. It's a very good textbook. Uh, I, I highly recommend that you read it, but you read it from a historical perspective. And, and, right. and here's right. why. Is a lot of the principles are still true about oh, the surgery. It's amazing. And all that. It's but amazing. I, here's, I, yeah, practice, get to that, Wes. I practice um, with a lot of knowledge from that book, and I've read it. Yeah. I've read it probably three times now, cover to cover. But, but what's wrong with well, what he thought about well, failure? Was Carl Misch wrong? He, he, he was wrong. Um, he, well, what did he think about it? What What did he? You're think? You're getting me to try to tell. It, it, I have to. Okay. I have to know. Or so, I. Or I. Go, I mean, if you, you know, I'll, biomechanics. Whatever, man. Okay, biomechanics. let's just say it. What is biomechanics? It's the study of mechanical laws relating to the movement. Did you get that? The movement or structure of living organisms. So basically, what we're saying is, is that your implant movement. Okay, if your implant moves. It will fail. Okay. So, or, or if it's under force, under of some, some kind. type of force, a wrong right. force or a. Right. Uh, or it can't support the force that it's under. Basically. Right. So basically, what Carl said is that if implants put compressive, str- compressive strain on bone, okay, compressive strain, that that is when bone is strongest. Okay. And then when implants put shear forces on bone, that is when bone is weakest. Now, this is how he designed his particular implant was with these things in mind. And in fact, that implant still has that design in mind. Right. So his idea, if we can kind of boil it down, really was if we should design implants like teeth. Yes. That we, we, we had these concepts of you know, crown to root ratio as an example. And we said, you know, if a molar has two roots, 
Well, maybe we should do right. two implants. So, for instance, he had this principle in, in contemporary implant dentistry that if you had a, let's say you had space number 19 or 30 available, and that was greater than 14 millimeters between 18 and 20, that you should use utilize two dental implants versus using one dental implant because yeah. of Yeah, and it all goes back to the same idea. Yeah, because you're you're figuring that the more surface area that you have, the the more you can resist so, force. Yeah. So many of you are saying, and here if you listening. overload, so the idea boils down yeah. to you can overload bone, and that by overloading bone, it will cause bone loss. That you you cause bone loss and therefore a failure. Right. And that was a, I mean, this is still a commonly held belief to this yeah. day. I mean, it's probably the number one reason why when you when you survey a room, like we did a couple of years ago, mm. we survey the room, why do most people think implants fail? And the top two reasons that I hear are occlusion yeah. or overloading of some type, right? okay, or hygiene. Right. Okay, those are the two things that you hear and what we're going to talk about today. So in that same room, though, let me ask, let me ask this. Yeah. And I'm going to ask our audience, <clears throat> how many of you, okay, have ever, that, that are seriously uh, serious about dental implants and place dental implants or just restore a lot of dental implants, have articulating paper forceps on every hygiene cassette so that you can check your occlusion on your dental implants and adjust it because yeah. you believe you truly believe that right. there is a biomechanical keep, issue with the if you don't keep the occlusion under control that's right that you might start having that bone you loss. Might, because i can tell you right now that i was that guy okay i was yeah. that guy and listen this is where i've came from you know back in 2003 when i graduated dental school um i started getting into dental implant therapy and when I started my private practice in 04, I was referring most of my dental implants. And every single unit dental implant that was placed in a particular office, that person was to receive an occlusal guard. <clears throat> now, yeah. I, I was all about that. I thought that that, and that's the time that I had the, the forceps. Now, ask yeah. me where those forceps are now, John. They're in the drawer. Right. And therefore balancing night guards and uh, sleep appliances <laughs> and yeah not, and so, exactly because there are reasons to check occlusion there but, are reasons you know to th check this occlusion. is one of the things that started i think breaking down wes and i even though we didn't even know each other at this time but our logic yeah. didn't work when you started going okay i know that not everybody's checking occlusion on their implants every single time they come in so you might have had it perfect the day you delivered it, but right. unless that opposing tooth is also an implant and never moves, you know, then you're going to have a tooth come into higher contact over time. You're going to have wear. You're going to have attrition. You're going to see broader contacts. You're going to see heavier contacts. You're going to have bruxism, and people aren't checking inclusion. So why aren't why aren't we seeing problems? So that was where it all maybe started with right. me questioning why are we not seeing problems? But really, so where John, I think it, it before you go yeah. on beyond like. Yeah, what yeah. we think is going on right now is do biomechanics apply to any part <clears throat> of dental implant therapy today? Mm. I wanted to ask you that question. I, think, I put it in the notes, and I wanted to ask you particularly yeah. because I wanted to hear your answer. We didn't even pre-produce this, uh, this answer, but yeah. do they apply to any part of dental implant therapy today? Yeah, I think that's a great question. <clears throat> Here's how I would answer that question, I think, um, having not really prepared for that. But <laughs> I, I think I think the way I would answer that question is that, and we're going to talk about why, but I think we're going to try to make a case to you today that are listening that, that occlusion and force doesn't matter as far as implant failure. But do biomechanics matter? Well, I think I think what it comes back to is there are some things from a technical standpoint, that you can overload components. So you can break stuff. You know, you can break components. So we do still have to think about how we're loading implants and the occlusal scheme that we choose in order to not stress components. 
because technical complications of screw loosening or fracturing an abutment or fracturing an implant, that is something that can happen. And that is something that is, but it's not truly biomechanics as much as it is just more mechanics. It's understanding that parts can only take a certain amount of force. But one of the things that we now know is that all of the force <clears throat> is concentrated into the top two millimeters of an implant once it's integrated. So, so you take an implant, let's say it's a 45 millimeter long implant or a 27 millimeter, it doesn't matter. Pick any length you want, the longest implant you would ever put in. Right. Well, once that implant's integrated, all the force, if you look at any of the any of the studies out there, is only concentrated in the top two millimeters. Now there's some slight, slight, slight force way down, but very, very little. It's basically irrelevant. So that was study what that, that was done in is, 1993. Yeah, it really isn't new. It just took us a while to understand like finite element analysis and be able to see how that worked. Mm -hmm. But what this means is that any size implant and any number of implants you put in, if you apply the same force to that system. Once the implant's integrated, the only thing that matters is maybe a one or two millimeter length, you know? So it really, it's more important that you're controlling the top of the implant, yeah. you know, the connection, for instance, may be more important or how you design the occlusion may affect the components, but it doesn't matter, for instance, the length of the implant, which goes completely counter to Mish's idea. Now his idea worked, and this is the thing that's funny because he was over engineering, and if I saw a case of his a few years ago, wandered, wandered into my practice, beautiful setup. I mean, no bone loss, had done a great job. But so his his reasoning wasn't coming from a bad place. It just wasn't really tested tr and tried yet to know well how little can we get away with, right? You know, and I think that that's the thing that's pushed us into our understanding of today is people started pushing the envelope, right? People started saying, okay. Well, let's try putting in fewer implants, right. and let's do all on four. Okay, that came pretty early, all right, relatively early. Let's do all on four with immediate loading and see what that does to the bone. Well, then what about short implants? And, and we're really going to get into that in a minute, but you know, if, if biomechanics matters, short implants should definitely not work, and yet they're, and yet they're working tremendously well. But I think that this whole idea... There's only, and I, I always have to bring this up because there's only really one paper that this whole overloading thing even came from. It's this paper by Isidore. I love to talk about it, and I won't talk about it much. But if you look at that study, it's very, very, very problematic. It's, a, it's an animal study, and the amount, the loads they were putting on these, on these implants were like four and five times the vertical dimension they started, you know, just, just to like see if they could literally knock them out of these animal, these monkeys' mouths. I mean, it was crazy, crazy, crazy. Definitely not a clinical conditions type of situation in a human mouth. So there's really not a lot of studies that show a direct cause and effect uh, of this. Now, there are some studies that indicate maybe there's something, but it, 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 we'll talk about that. Right. So, so if, the, if not biomechanics, though, then that yeah. begs the question, then what is causing failure? What is causing but, failure? But, but before we get into that, Wes, let's talk about why it's not. Let's talk about short implants. Let's talk yeah. about what really messed with us in this concept. Th this concept of short implants really does mess with your mind. And I know many of you that are um, placers that listen to this uh, or listening to this episode right now may feel uncomfortable placing short implants, and you should. Um, yeah. as I've told John, I feel like that it's probably one of the hardest implants to place because why are you placing it? One, you're placing it in a situation where you don't have a lot of bone. And in some cases, these implants are five and a half to six millimeters in length. And if you ad adhere to buffers of, of one to two millimeters, then you're dealing with millimeters, um, of right. in, in error. Danger zone. It's danger yeah. zone at this point. You're putting things very close to anatomy. Uh, you're providing a patient for a restoration that it everything just has to be done just right. So it's, it's an expert-only procedure, but it's been done and tried and true. And I love this study. We've mentioned it before, <clears throat> but in 2017, um, one of our favorite people, Paul uh, Fusigato, and um, he tested in his own 
practice, okay? All right. In his yeah. own practice, 1,300 and He's some implants between six yeah. and nine millimeters. Now, I don't know about you, but I would love to go be in his practice to see the follow up on these. But the follow up was between that was, this that was, was the amazing. This part. is amazing. Between 60 and 229 months in function. Okay. The success Crazy. rate. So so he only started counting at five years. He only started counting at five. Like now, you no, know there's no we're not talking some little one year study <laughs> no. here like 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 Zimmer's trying what? to put out with specular metal. Wait I had to throw minute, it in there. <laughs> what did we'll you come say? to that later. What, what? But we're talking about a minimum five years. Minimum. And and to have this published in Jomi, a single guy. Yeah, single guy. There's only have, one guy on the entire yeah, paper. He's the only author. It's his practice. And it went up to, you know, a, a crazy amount of, of, of follow up, like ten years almost, were some of the older ones. So, well, what was the what were the findings, Wes, of this study? Oh, what was what was the success rate? How did they work? They all failed, right? No. <laughs> it's it's really <laughs> no, they didn't. Uh, the success rate was very high, ninety seven percent plus. You can read the paper for yourself if you want. If you want, you know, you want the abstract, we'll send it to you or the link in the description or whatever. But the interesting thing here is that we're not talking, we're talking about, listen to this, 1,300 and some <clears throat> implants placed at the time of transalveolar sinus elevations. Now, that's a fancy term for a sinus yeah. bump, okay? Restored <clears throat> with single right. crowns. So it's even we're, a now, more... It's single crowns. It's right. not splinted restorations is what we're talking about here is single yep. unit posterior stuff. That's what I was telling John before right. the beginning of the show is that everybody freaks out about free-ended implants, okay? That means, like, right, you put right. one in 19 Especially and Especially in 18. the maxillary sinus with grafted bone. Oh, I mean, this is the worst this is the possible worst situation. Thing. And he basically lays out his cards on the table. He's like, so, I got all shorties, 1,344 right. of them, minimum five-year follow-up, ha- during sinus elevations. Right. I mean... And he gets ninety seven percent success rate with single unsplinted crowns. Right. So so ask him know, if occlusion matters. You know, so that's what I'm saying. Because if we have a you know, the problem that the biggest problem that we have and what, what studies have shown with short implants is not implant failure. In fact, what it showed is that this once the implant integrated, if it was a short implant, the success rate beyond like just a few months is is ridiculous. Yep. That short implants, if they're going to fail, they're going to fail so fast, it's actually a good thing. And in my opinion, I've been placing shorts for the past three years. And when they fail, they fail fast. You take them out, you graft it, you go back and you put another one in, and it's successful. But uh, when they're successful, they're very successful and they hold bone. But the problems that we run into with short implants is the mechanics. Okay? Right. John, right. tell us about that. Yeah, the thing not that, biomechanics, you know, right? Because we already showed they right. work biomechanics. You asked me that question earlier. You know, well, where does biomechanics matter? And this is why I would say it's not biomechanics, but the mechanics do matter because going back to this idea of crown to root ratio that we had with teeth, yeah. you know, there there were problems where you could cause a tooth failure if you had uh, a, 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 a improper ratio of crown to root. Well, with right. implants, crown to implant ratio doesn't seem to matter as far as uh, bone loss, as is evidenced by the short implant study here, that does not seem to be correlated So basically what whatsoever. you're saying is, is but, that we could have a massive crown, like a right. two to one ratio, maybe even a yeah. three to one ratio. Because right. a, and, and, and bone is stable. And bone is stable. And that looks right. so, so the weird implant's on an happy. X-ray. It's so weird. Right, it does. It does. It messes with us. And but 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 true that there are problems with overloading it's just overloading of components right because now you start talking about a small diameter implant with a small say an internal conical connection type of implant um that and and i will say he was putting in internal conical connection implants so he he wasn't having that problem as much but you know smaller diameter internal conical connection where those walls are not super super strong you know, or the screw is put under, say, a lot of stress, like a different design of an implant, like, say, external hex. Yeah. It, you know, screw under a lot of stress. Now you put that under a tremendous amount of load. 
because it's a long lever arm and there are potential problems with fracture. So we, we are not saying, so don't take this wrong. We're not saying don't worry about short implants at all as far as you know failures. We're just saying that we want you to be thinking about the fact that we think we can just put this to, to rest here that short implants are the proof or one of the strongest proofs uh, of that occlusion is not the determining factor in implant failure. And we have a ton of other studies, which we just don't have time to go through. We gave a whole talk on this a couple of years ago that show very clearly that there's uh, a lot of discussion about what it, how much does occlusion really matter at all? And, and you know, I think I'll just cite this one, Wes, you know, because I, I, we, could, we could spend a while on this discussion. But, you know, the summary from a 2015 study here was that, you know, we found insufficient evidence to establish firm clinical guidelines for implant occlusion. Uh, and, and they said that little scientific evidence supports a direct cause-effect relationship between occlusal factors and deleterious biological outcomes for, in your, for osseointegrated implants. To the contrary, the limited evidence available at this time supports the position there is no direct cause-effect relationship between occlusion and disease process, um, and most of the evidence is based on expert opinion in vitro studies and animal studies as opposed to human studies, true crossover type of studies where you do a prospective study. Say, you know, you try one occlusal scheme and then you switch them to something else and you see does it affect the implant. There's just nothing like that even out there. No. But what we do see is really I feel like the short implant literature gives us much more information about how much this matters because it's the same idea. You know, you have increased force. You should see a, a negative outcome and yet we really don't seem to see it. Right. So, so I think I think you know where where <clears throat> we need to kind of look at this is that I, I I feel like that sometimes in dentistry because of the way our educational system is slow to move and change because it is hard to move a ship, okay? And mm -hmm, when you have mm -hmm. somebody whose name is behind a textbook and it's lasted as long as it is, and it takes yeah. so long to, to, to create a textbook and to get it in print and to distribute it, and by the time it's in your hands, you've all heard this, it's, it's a little outdated. It's outdated a lot of times. It's a little yeah. outdated. And so where do you turn? You turn to the dental guys. <laughs> well, I want to say, say one thing, though, about this, okay? I have, I'm not saying you're wrong, because I completely agree with you about the outdated textbook idea. But you know, I think the big reason, and this is why we're gonna, we're, I'm just gonna get controversial here. Well, I, right? I know where you're going with this because I, I think, think I was the going big there. reason why this has lived for so long, <clears throat> this whole occlusion thing, is because surgeons want an out. I, I think surgeons you're right. want to be I, able I, to blame exactly right. somebody else besides themselves for failures. Because I they had a surgeon to say, try to blame me for a failure of an anterior implant. This was the time when cone beam was coming on at kind of big. He mm -hmm. had a machine. I didn't. Um, I utilized his machine to take it for my patients and for patients that I worked with him. And I'll never forget me saying to my office manager, I'm never going to restore a dental implant from another outside source that I didn't, wasn't there for the surgery and didn't see the implant go in the bony housing. Okay. I want to see a CT of the implant mm. in the bony housing. I took a picture the other day, John, of an implant that I didn't place that I've done a, a kind of a retrofit fabrication of a screw retained restoration on. So I took the first CT on this girl because she was due for a panorex and anybody that's had a dental implant, I'm taking a, I'm taking a CT on. Okay. So I take a CT and guess where the majority of the implant is. She has it in number four, uh, five position, five position. The implant <clears throat> is in her cheek, okay? Oh Only the upper third is in the bony housing. Now, who did the screw retain restoration on that? This guy right here, because her crown kept popping off, and I converted her crown to that. But that's the thing here, is that if occlusion mattered, okay, mm -hmm. her implant would have failed, Okay. Right. And and, but yet and, and surgeons really want an out when it fails. But why can't we just say, hey, when there's a failure, it's just a failure, and sometimes we just don't understand. 
Well, I think that that I think that the reason for that is that number one, that it's in human nature. It's Occam's razor, right? I get yeah. I'll get all philosophical. Is you know the the, 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 the answer that's the most logical is the one we want to go to, the one that fits the best, you know? And so Occam's razor tells us, Hey, pick the simplest answer because that satisfies our mind to feel like, well, that yep. was occlusion, you know, sometimes that just happens and you just overloaded the it's, bone. Everybody goes, yeah, yeah, yeah that, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Oh you know, but, yeah. Oh yeah. You see him yeah, in, you yeah, see him in like the lecture that, like, like that. That Cause, sounds cause really then, good. It's easy to then tell. The surgeon, right. So then the surgeon can tell the patient, well, it wasn't my implant. It was just that the crown was too high, or you're a Bruxer. Maybe you blame it on nobody. You just say you're a Bruxer. It's right. the patient's sleep fault. Sleep apnea calls but your it, implant it, <laughs> Right, it's sleep apnea. So I think what, what that has given everybody, if you're placing implants, is, is out that we don't deserve because right. it's not true. It's not proven, and the dental guys are going to go ahead and just call it out. Like, put that myth to rest. Actively mm -hmm. pursue putting that myth to so rest with your surgeon, or if you're a surgeon... I would challenge you to really look at your own feelings about occlusion and talk to your general dentist about that restoring dentist and say, guys, maybe I've been blaming my implant failures on something that doesn't really exist. And maybe that also makes you feel more comfortable about putting short implants in. Yeah. I so let's you. talk though about, okay, so if it's not occlusion, all right, let's talk about well, why. Okay, what really does make implants fail? And, I, and we don't really have a whole show to because we, we, we're going to have a whole show on this. But I do want to get into this a little bit, Wes, because... Well, let's talk about what stage of failure are we talking about here, okay? Yeah. So we can yeah. categorize early and, you know, early failures <clears throat> and late failures. And Mish categorized in his book. And anymore, it seems like that our um, crown and bridge you know, or actually our implant companies are pushing us to restore implants faster. Um, but let's just say that early failures are really anything inside of a year, okay? And once we get beyond a year, most of the time I tell my patients this. I say, look, all research points to the fact that you know, we could pretty much put a crown on your tooth, a permanent crown, at 8 to 12 weeks. And do we have to do that? No, we can wait a little bit longer. We can wait indefinitely, okay? But after the crown is on there for a year past surgery, okay, mm -hmm. and you're chewing on your tooth, okay, well, it's pretty much your tooth from here on out, and probably you're never going to have an issue. But if you do, right. most likely... It is due to this. Now, I'll say that here in just a minute. But early failures, okay? Mm -hmm. er That's a great, great point to di right. differentiate right. early and late. Right. When we so talk here's about what this, I tell my patients. I say, look, difference. I know that the science shows that what I can do is I can put a crown on your tooth pretty much between 8 and 12 weeks. If I see everything move in the right direction, and I use a penguin, okay, <clears throat> I use an ISQ that I tested it. Yep. Now, I, I wasn't doing that up until probably six months ago, but still told them this. Eight to 12 weeks, I'm going to put your crown on if they want it that quick, and if I see everything clinically is moving good. And if we have a failure inside the first year, you know what I chalk it up to? I chalk it up to it's, it's either infection. Didn't integrate. Didn't integrate. It's either there was, yeah, it didn't integrate for sure, Okay, but why? We don't know sometimes, okay? But right. it's it's a rejection, okay? It's just like anything else. It needs a revision. And most But like, there's a possibility of the whys there being right. many things. Right. Like you I, say, infection. I think that in good surgical procedure, we can lower the risk of infection down to about 1%. And I think that's the 1%, John, of mm -hmm. the three that most of the time that we get in our, in our 97%. Agreed. So the 1% in that first year infection okay and then you've also got you know using say dull drills with no irrigation you're getting heat generation that's another Whoa, just a a, for instance you're saying that there is such a thing <laughs> wait you're saying i gotta change my drills you're saying i gotta like oh, man trade those out they're not like forever you know you're saying guided surgery is not perfect you're what because so, it's hard to irrigate it's hard oh. what oh wait you're Wait. saying that guided surgery is harder on your drills and they wear out faster? <laughs> Wait a minute, John. Yeah. So here, We're just here. wanting you guys to think about these things, you know? Yes, yeah. you can burn up bone. You can. When you prepare it. 
Yes, yes. Uh, that can cause an early failure. And no, you might not know that. Hey, John, tell us about the and, failure that you had the other day that, that, hey, look, I've had one, now you've had one, okay? Tell, right. me, tell me about your early failure. Yeah, It yeah, kind of well, makes you had, feel bad. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I had a, a an implant that was placed on an, an anterior lower, uh, uh, anterior, uh, lower uh, central, <clears throat> and the adjacent central had a huge composite in it. You could see it when I put the implant in giant composite near the pulp and then came back three months later come back in isq i was going to isq it and there's a there's a swelling down near uh, around the gingival and down near the vestibule that was a mucus seal like, oh. that was a mucus seal wasn't it right i'm like yeah <laughs> mucus seal it's he just he, he just got a dorito down there it's a you mucus know, seal. Really, just I'm it's just the like, easy yeah, answer just, it's the easy answer mucus yeah, seal you everything's chips a mucus this seal. weekend or what <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Do you have some Doritos? Exactly. I knew a popcorn husk, you know, something. Please, God, give me something. I'm just like praying. But the implant is definitely failing. There's separation coming out oh, from around man. the from around this thing. And I mean, I had done like everything by the book. And then I take a PA. And the adjacent tooth, what had happened is the adjacent tooth had be had, was necrotic. And uh, I didn't, I didn't see that any. There was no sign really of set, maybe a slight widened PDL on that yeah, other tooth. Yeah, you showed it to me. Nothing I, anybody could. Yeah, no, nothing you would have really thought much about. And then now what you, you look at it and that infection. <laughs> I know exactly. Like cold test every tooth, but that infection from like number twenty four had spread laterally to number twenty five implant and took the implant out with with it. So. Yeah, so things happen early, but getting past the early, okay? Because yeah, like we can all year. let's go past one year. Yeah, let's go out a year. The, it's let's been go to in five. function. Let's go one to five. Yeah. okay. Yeah, one to five. The, the implant's been in function now. It's successful from a standpoint of no pain, no chewing, and then now all of a sudden, you start seeing bone loss, or maybe you see progressive well, bone loss man. from like year one to year five. Bone. And now you start getting into this area, yeah. which is controversial to say the least. This is where about I want what's the dental on. guys need to challenge the implant community to figure out. We really don't know what's going on here. Okay. Yeah. Now we can make guesses. I think one of the better guesses that John's going to talk about here, we got to hear the man talk about it in Sweden. We got to hear him yep. talking about it again <clears throat> two years ago at the, the AO. AO. And... And I think I just want to say from the dental guys, John and I want to challenge those that are in education right now. We want more information on late failures. We want to know yeah. why they're happening because if I if we understand why, then I think that we could probably fix it. So, John, what is the most accepted, like, I know it's controversial and we all have right. ideas, but I, I think it's the most accepted theory right now. John? It is. It, it was It was enough accepted that when JPD did their annual review of the scientific literature last year, they spent a good paragraph mm. in it about implant failure, mentioning just what uh, this one man, Thomas Albrechtson, um, who's one of the early, you know, he was part I mean, of the original Brandemark yeah, he group. He worked with the original team. Yeah, he was one of the, you know, he really, I mean, anybody that has been around implants any amount of time is going to run across his, his studies. I loved it. He showed... At the AO, he showed a, a picture of an implant <clears throat> that had 50% uh, bone loss. And he just said, so what would you do? What would you, all you people out here do with this implant? And then everybody's kind of talking about that. And he says, take it out, right? Take it out. We take it out and we put a new implant in because this is horrible dentistry, right? This is horrible below the standard of care to have this. And then he says, well, what if I took this x-ray and it's the same implant? And, and it looked the same, you know, at a year. Would you still take it out? What if I told you it was 40 years? And it was a 40-year follow-up. I mean, who even has a 40-year follow-up? It was a 40-year follow-up of an original Brandenmark implant, and the bone level was exactly the same, okay? And we've all seen these. We've seen these implants where they lose some bone, and then they stop losing bone. And that blows away almost every theory we have out there, because if there's a problem, say, with, you know, periodontal pathogens, well... Why the heck doesn't it keep losing bone? Right. You know? So so it got him thinking. And he, as he's doing research into failure, his theory is that there is a steady state equilibrium, is what he calls it, between acceptance and rejection. Mm -hmm. That the body is, I mean, implants, let's face it, we want to act like they're like 
the body loves them. Well, honestly, it's a, it's a foreign body. I think it's a foreign really, body. We need to change going into the surgery of calling this something other than a failure. We need to change change the thing here. We need to say, look, we're going to put a titanium root, and we're hoping your body accepts it. Most of the time, it does with no problems, but there are but times. His whole, but, but his whole point, though, is that osteointegration is rejection. It's it, the body it saying, it's the body I'm saying, going to I don't grow like bone. I'm going to grow bone in order to wall off right. this foreign body. What's and a periapical yes. cyst, right? Yeah. Yeah, it, it basically says we're going to grow bone and and and, and encapsulate right. this foreign body so that my immune system can kind of insulate itself. And that is what we call IC integration, according to Albrechtson. That is rejection. But he says then you could have more rejection and ex- than acceptance. In other words, he's hit in his theory at so least, that, and this is where we get into no man's land, right. is his theory is <clears throat> that possibly there's a connection between pro-inflammatory conditions such as say rheumatoid arthritis or right. uh, you know periodontal disease why, maybe why we see an increased risk of late failures in periodontal patients is it really the pathogens or is it that their IL-1 you know uh, genetics are turned up higher and they have more pro-inflammatory cytokine release when they go through this rejection phase mm. you know now that's an interesting thought that got Wes and I think and we looked at each other oh, in that man. lecture and we were like what? Yeah. That could make some sense make as difference. to why, and that could make a lot of sense as to why you see failures randomly yeah. at years out that you can't always, and it doesn't mean that every single patient is this, but this is where we need more information, Wes. We don't really know. We don't really, we don't know. really know. I mean, we're talking about the two percenters, okay? But honestly, any failure in a dental implant placement is a, is a tough thing to fix, um, it's not something that, you know, this is why I think some of the training that we do needs to involve how to treat some failure because you're going to have some failure down the yep. road. It's not just the easy failures you're going to get. It's the ones that five years that boggle the mind. I've seen it. John, I showed you an x-ray of a full arch case, splinted implants. Occlusion is definitely yeah. not a problem here. Okay. And then all of the sudden yep. I have panorexes year one, two three, four, and then all of a sudden, year five, 50% bone loss on every implant. Now, you now, tell I remember me. Santa, it's crazy. You tell me. Now, the, now you, there's something not right. Now, either it's something about happened there in that patient's body that said, right. nope, and, right. and, and you get this massive amount of bone loss. Now, we don't understand this. Um, no right. one really does. They think they do, but I think that the research right. needs to be done in this area. Now, John, let's talk about, this is cool stuff, but there are some companies that are marketing themselves to be moving faster. Okay. Like right. it's all right. about getting your crown back in two weeks when it comes to the lab. Like you <clears> take <throat> an impression, you send it to your lab and what is it about two weeks? Well, who came up with two weeks? Well, there's a company right. happens to be Zimmer Biomet, and they have basically done some initial trials and testing, and it's interesting. Uh, they have a particular type of metal. John, you know a little bit more about it than I do. I just got introduced to it the other day, so tell me yeah. a little bit about this. Well, uh, trabecular metal. Yep. So this is not a new thing. Uh, it's been done in, in other areas uh, with... Uh, uh, orthopedics. Um, and what this material is, is it's actually made of uh, tantalum, uh, elemental tantalum rather than titanium. And it's basically like a mesh work uh, of, of this tantalum material. So it kind of looks like a, it kind of looks like an old, like a porous type implant, you know, yeah. kind of that idea, but it's more of a mesh work. Like press. And right. And so they have threads, they have threads at the top, and then there's an area of this tantalum, uh, trabecular metal, and then there's threads at the bottom to facilitate still like a normal osteotomy and insertion of the implant so it's not a press fit. 
But what um, they introduced this implant years ago, and actually at first it was a tremendous failure. Uh, so, and and actually uh, one of the guys that initially right. uh, tested it broke broke the first one as it was being put in. So that was awesome. We know that because guy. we know that guy. But uh, but the the long term with this was that they did a study uh, that was a, a single study. Um, that was back from 2013, and the guy did one study uh, with one year follow-up and, and was putting these things in, the idea being maybe we can load these much earlier, much quicker, uh, to try to beat out SL Active, I think, from Strawman. Right. And, uh, and they found in this study group that they had in, I think it ended up being 22 implants total in the group, that they had 100% success with uh, loading. Uh, it, with, they were immediately provisionalized out of occlusion, with single acrylic uh, crowns, and then after seven to 14 days of healing, they were definitively restored in occlusion with PFM, and they had 100% success. We get that. That's cool. But That's actually, what's called a pilot only 17 study. subjects completed the one-year clinical follow-up. Yeah. That's and, a cool and study. And so now we, have, now we have a company saying, Put an implant well, in today, should... deliver the crown in two weeks. Right. That's what they're selling, and our, you guys. And the rep is selling, selling this, this to this surgeon, and they're going, oh, the rep well, tried don't to worry about all to, those. The rep tried to sell it to my assistant, and she came to me, and she was like, what in the world is he talking about? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So be careful. And, and, and I think if you were to actually talk to the researchers who did this, they would not tell you. They would not tell you to go out in private practice and do what this rep is recommending that this that this surgeon do. They would not say, go out and use this. They would say, this was interesting. They would say, this this should breed further study. This should, we need a multi-center randomized controlled trial. Right. We need to compare this to a regular implant, load those at two weeks. Let's How about let's compare another company and load those at two weeks and let's see who really is better. Is it really the trabecular metal right. or has it nothing to do with any of that stuff and it's just a marketing ploy. But here you have somebody who's ch actually changing their practice model because of a study. And so we want to be sure that it's it's important that we're not going into these things with, with pilot studies. That's yeah. why when we talk to you about a study on the show, we talk about 1,344 short implants, five years minimum, 10 years. So most of them are more in the seven to 10 year range that were followed by this guy. That's legit, man. That's yeah. something we can put, hang our hat on. So in, it's important to not push it. But I think, Wes, I want to I maybe just turn it one different direction before we finish because we're running a little low on time. But let's talk about, okay, so if occlusion doesn't matter, all right, with implants, but it does matter from a mechanical standpoint. We've kind of established that you still have to respect the components and the weak points. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about some practical things. If you're listening to the show, you're like, okay, this has all been kind of pie in the sky, theoretical discussion. Right. Okay, what practically do we do with our occlusal schemes? How do we set up our implants in order to minimize you know, the problems? Or, or do we really worry about that, Wes? What well, do I you do when you're practiced with, with setting up the occlusal schemes and the shapes of the crowns and things like that? Okay, so let's, let's, let's start with the most difficult situation and work from there. Okay, the most difficult situation is in this, the posterior. Okay, and I'm not talking about premolars, I'm talking about molars. And mm -hmm. so, let's say anything 18, 19 area, 30, 31, 14, 15, 2, 3, those areas there. Okay, so <clears throat> anytime that we are in those areas, of course, I want to know what the quality of the bone was at the time of placement. <clears throat> Number two is that if I'm doing single unit dental implant therapy in the posterior, okay, in those areas. I want an implant that has the fewest amount of mechanical problems, okay? Now, what I mean is, is I don't want the screws to loosen up, okay? You want a robust connection. I want a robust connection. I don't want external hex, okay? I don't mm -hmm. want internal hex. I want basically a deep conus connection. And, and, right. what, and, and the reason why is I don't want to deal with, you know, occlusal problems. Now, how do I design right. my crown? Okay, and we're not going to talk about abutments, but we're going to actually talk about the the table, the occlusion table. Yeah, the occlusion, table. the occlusion ta yeah, the that, table. Yeah, that's really where we want to hit. I still attain to a slightly more narrow occlusal table. One, mm -hmm. because every time you take a tooth out and you put a tooth back. 
the patient, the very first thing they say is, man, it feels big. It feels big because they haven't had anything there in six months or whatever, even if they hadn't had anything there in eight weeks. So the second reason that we like a smaller occlusal table is it minimizes um, working um, or group function uh, contacts. I don't like Mm -hmm. them. I'm not right. saying that this implant couldn't withstand or this crown couldn't withstand, but I'm right. mainly looking at it from a prosthetic standpoint. But you're trying to be smart. I'm trying to be a little smart about this. So my triangular ridges and, and my I think th- that it's going to be a flatter yep. occlusal scheme in those posterior regions. Right. And so yeah, you're minimizing guidance off of this that's because you just it's not a matter addition. of implant failure as it is, you know, not putting stress on the connection. Well, what I'm also doing is I'm protecting the <clears throat> opposing teeth because if I put mm. something that is rigid, that doesn't move, that doesn't have a PDL against a tooth that does move, I might have some issues with that if it's in complete group function and I lock the occlusion in. So I yeah. do centric Good stops. Point. I keep it narrow, not extremely narrow. It looks normal to the patient. They have no clue. And right. then, and right. then um, I look at uh, flattening that occlusal table down. Now, premolars yep. get a little more interesting because some premolars, at, depending on the occlusal scheme when it comes into group function or some type of posterior guidance, I might be okay with picking up some guidance off of a premolar, just depending on the situation. So that's okay, and you run into aesthetics. You can't shorten the cuss down on number five and number 12. Because for, for a woman or a man that's concerned about aesthetics or has a high smile, that's going to have to look real. So, so a good summary of what we're saying for posterior would be, <clears throat> you know, make limit the size of your occlusal table to what is acceptable aesthetically right. and gives you adequate function for centric stops, minimize excursive contacts just simply to protect the connection. Now, as you get more into the anterior... Yeah, all that goes away. Qu- all that goes away, and you start thinking, can I put guidance on an implant? Right, really, I Absolutely. think what drives Absolutely. the tre- treatment in the anterior is, one, the aesthetics, and then right. the function on the finished ceramic, okay? Right, So did right. you get what I just said there? Yeah, it's Basically, a great point. The, because implants uh, have a higher rate of porcelain fracture. That's exactly right. The, so we well, got to think about they that. They don't move, okay? So they don't give, they don't have a PDL. So what I typically do is I'm looking for really smooth transitions from tooth to implant, from tooth to implant crown, I should say it. And that, that my areas, my design of my abutment even in screw retain restoration, it's there to support the function of the tooth and provide right. for proper aesthetics. So and it's minimum a, unsupported porcelain. Oh, minimum, uh, minimum. It's a similar design as you would have for a good porcelain fused to metal crown. That's exactly um, right. You know, you want exactly supported the porcelain. Situation. And you know, but the thing, the implant really is the minimum part of the discussion in the anterior because it really the forces is. are t- forces are low. Well, that's you know, where there's the, just and the failure rate is so low. It's it's really about one percent in the upper and lower jaw in the interior. Yeah. So, so so let's just kind of say you know it's it's common sense occlusion here. It's it's setting up occlusion a lot like you would with teeth, but just minimizing forces on components. Remembering that that's really your greatest risk, uh, not the not the the biology as much as it is the mechanical. You know, and I think uh, you know if you've listened to this show, I, I think you've probably had some things challenge. You know, we, we sure did a few years ago and maybe you're already there. Maybe you were already aware of the, uh, of the controversy about occlusion and you've already kind of changed your mind. But if this changed your mind or if you got you thinking, if you're in school right really, now and you're listening to this yeah. and you're thinking, man, my professor just taught us something totally different. Well, you gotta, you gotta do that for the test, <laughs> right? You gotta do that for the test, right. but I challenge exactly. your professors but give it, we, but to we want to hear listen. Them. Challenge our yeah, professors yeah. to Get, listen to this and challenge. Yeah, because we just us. heard from some of our listeners when we gave this talk a couple of years ago that the GPR that they were at are not is not. In fact, they're still teaching Mish. So we just want you to be thinking about this. And 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 you know, if you've been challenged by this, we want you to give us some feedback. Let us know what you th- we think. Mm. If you think we're wrong, we want you to post it up on Facebook. We're not afraid. You know, we're not afraid to to be wrong, and we're not afraid to have a great discussion about who's right and who's wrong, and talk about some literature with you. If you have been challenged and you've had your mind changed, that's great feedback for us. We just want to get some feedback from you. We want you to know that this is messing with you. Or, you know, if you want a way to talk to your surgeon 
about this. Let's have a good discussion about that on social media and talk about what's a good way to talk about how this exact conversation could happen with you and your surgeon if you're a restorative dentist who's trying to figure out how to communicate this to your surgeon that maybe it's not the occlusion after all. It's a great discussion. And Wes, I, I think that the, this has been a show we've talked about doing for a long time. It's been a lot of fun. And I, I mean, Wes, why don't you close this out, man? Well, all I have to say is that make sure you use throat pack or get yourself a... <laughs> Airway armor. Airway armor. Because I'm, yeah. I'm sitting here thinking, man, you know, I need to order some more. And uh, there you go. because it is really a great product. And I, I really, yeah. I feel like that the show started this way. And I'm still thinking <laughs> yeah. about that lady. Let's go back By to the that way, again. her chest x ray came back clear. We never did say that. <laughs> yeah, you never did tell us the punchline. That's good. <laughs> so, very glad. But anyway, um, listen, I, I think it's time to, to kind of uh, put this to rest. But. We are super excited to talk about this kind of thing because there is some controversy to it. And listen, if you if you are listening to this and you're thinking, you know what, I've got something to say and I want to mention it to these guys, hey, hit us up on Facebook, send us a message on Twitter. Listen, you can reach out to us at any time. We'd be glad to talk to you about what we think. And um, we've got some great things coming up, and I'm excited about what's coming this next month um, at the Spear Summit. There's going to be oh, yeah. some things that we're going to challenge those guys with. And so keep listening, keep watching. And for John, I'm Wes, and we are The Dental Guys. <laughs>